thanks for having me here. And um, today we'll just quickly talk about the stability of variable selection methods. So when we discuss statistical genetics, I think one of the main objective is to really understand the genetic predisposition to certain diseases for an individual. So there are usually two related but distinct goals. One is to discover. So you wanna identify variants responsible for different disease susceptibility. And the other is to predict. So you wanna figure out how these variations come together to influence one's disease risk, right? So mathematically, we're seeking after the conditional distribution of Y given X and Z, where Z can be uh, some environmental variables that are unobserved. So the default way uh, to identify genetic variants and do variable selection is to do GWAS. So usually we analyze each variant one at a time. So it's a univariate approach. We apply the stringent threshold to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. And we identify a few variants across the whole genome. Uh, for prediction, we simply weight the selected variants based on the estimated effect size. The problem is that if our goal is to predict, then those GWAS signals alone account for too small of a proportion of phenotypic variation. So naturally, people start saying, why don't we relax this threshold and include many more variants, right? And one of the major strengths for this approach is that we can see linkage disequilibrium, the, just the correlation between these genetic variants, we can see them as a blessing. Right? So even though it's very problematic if you're trying to figure out the causal variant, but for prediction, these highly correlated variants can serve as surrogates for each other. So as long as they're correlated with some variants with real effect sizes, then you should do just fine. The problem is the blessing is sometimes an illusion. So in genetics, a very difficult task is to do um, trans-ethnic portability. So from this plot, you can clearly see that relaxing the GWAS threshold and including many more variants isn't really great. And in fact, the further you move away from the Europeans, um, the worse your prediction becomes if you only train on a European-only data set. So what's, what's happening here exactly? So the idea is that we haven't talked about what happens when the distribution of the input variables change. Right? We assume that X and Y both come from some fixed joint distribution and it doesn't change, but in reality, they change all the time. So it's probably more common to see that the training and test data sets are being derived from different distributions. And for genetic data, these different ethnicities have different LD structures. So the correlation between the variants can change. And what's also very common is that the joint distribution can differ even within the same data set. So especially when you have large scale data collection efforts like EHRs, like biobanks, then the whole thing of this increased performance that relies heavily on these correlations can be a mirage or simply um, unstable at best. So that gives us an opportunity to revisit variable selection, see if we can select a bunch of stable variables uh, that help us generalize to different environments better. So I uh, just want to quickly talk about a study with it um, with cystic fibrosis related diabetes or CFRD. So uh, in short, we have a time to event outcome that shows the onset of this disease, close to 20 hundred individuals and about 4,000 pre-chosen variants. Um, the goal here is to construct a model to evaluate this time dependent risk based on the genetic and clinical measures early in life. So what happens is that if we just fit a common variable selection method here, like lasso, we can see that it's very, very unstable, right? So on the x-axis here, we have the univariate effect sizes of each variant. Um, we bootstrap the original data set 100 times and apply lasso to each of the bootstrap samples. So the y-axis here shows how often a SNP gets selected. And we can see that the inclusion frequency is positively correlated with the effect sizes, as it should. But at any given effect size, we can see that there is a lot of variation in this inclusion frequency, right? Which means that a, a different sample can give you a very different model just by chance alone. So we decided to employ a resampling-based approach called stability selection, 
um, which can be used to improve upon any existing variable selection method. So the essence is very simple. You sample half the data set without re replacement, then use your favorite algorithm on the chosen subset and record the selected variables. You repeat the same procedure at k times and simply record the inclusion frequency for each variable. So a variable j is deemed stable if this inclusion frequency exceeds a predefined threshold. And with this procedure, procedure, you can derive some theoretical bounds on the number of noise variables you end up selecting. So we can see here that using this approach, we can achieve similar performance, but with much fewer variables. So the chosen variables here are the, are the ones that performs consistently in different subsets of the data. So we can see that um, stability selection here in red are on the top and they have similar performance with lasso, but tends to select much fewer variants. At the same time, it outperforms the conventional p-value thresholding, which tends to select too many variables when the effect sizes are moderate. So um, here we just show that, yes, um, the high risk and low risk individuals in our validation set have quite different risk profiles over their lifetime. So even there are empirical evidence that suggests um, it works quite well in practice, but we like to dive a little bit into it and see where this strength really comes from. And um, one thing that we have found is that these sort of resampling based approach is more robust in the presence of outliers or influential points. So imagine our input variables X is now sourced from a mixture distribution. So here the pi really controls for the proportion of outliers uh, in the data set. So we can think of this as individuals from a different ethnicity or individuals from uh, different healthcare centers. And here we show the true positive rate of the three different methods uh, when we vary this pi. And the first thing we note is that the multivariate approach like lasso or stability selection outperforms the univariate approach p-value thresholding but what's interesting is that stability selection on the top is more stable compared to lasso, even though on average, they're, they're quite similar. So the reason is that when you sample half your data set multiple times, the vast majority of these subsamples would not be heavily influenced by some outliers. And in lasso, the, your choice of the penalization parameter lambda can be quite unstable. So in one way we can argue that stability selection is very similar to the spirit of robust statistics, right? You just want to model the core of the data and make the outliers or influential points less influential to the model you have. And one other advantage um, we're going to skim through is that it's more robust in the presence of multiple subpopulations. So it's very similar to the outlier case, but now it's not just a part, a small part of your data set, but you can have two, three, four different environments um, derived from different distributions. So the method uh, stability selection is, is great at recovering variables that are contributing in all the environments. So it ignores variables that are unstable because they only they're only effective in certain subpopulations. So conceptually, um, we can think of it as a way to generalize to multiple domains or unseen domains when we don't have this exact information on the subpopulations uh, in our data set. And uh, just the last note that this added stability, how this added stability manifests itself in risk predictions. So these are three randomly chosen individuals in our data set. And we can see that um, the variability for stability selection is much lower compared to the other two. So I think it's quite encouraging that um, it does provide some more stable results when there are some perturbations to the data you have. And um, just a few takeaways. So increased predictive performance that relies heavily on these correlation can be quite unstable. And um, to have variable selection methods that emphasize stability can help generalizing to unseen domains and uh, hopefully achieve sparsity and better interpretability for the models. So things like stability selection, it's a quite powerful approach to encourage selecting variables that consistently performs in different subsets of your data. 
And it does, uh, through the CFRD study, we does show that it achieves comparable performances um, in estimated risk with fewer variables compared to the vanilla approaches. And uh, that's it. That concludes my presentation and uh, open to questions right now.